Amen. All right. Uh, here in Luke chapter number two, as we were this morning, it being Christmas soon, we're going to preach another uh, subject or another sermon on the subject of Christmas. The title is Misunderstandings, Misconceptions, and Myths of Christmas. Some of these you may have heard, some of them you may not have, but we read through the Christmas story every year. It just shows that we need to be more diligent in our reading. And not just take things that we hear for granted. Not just receive everything that we hear, but like the Bereans were, they heard everything, but then they sought out to see if they were so. That's what we should do in all ways. Now, most of what we're going to focus on tonight is going to be actually with the Christmas story. So we'll be here in Luke chapter number 2, and then we'll also be flipping over to the book of Matthew. Now, here in Luke chapter number 2, the very first misconception, the very first misconception of the Christmas story I want to point out to you, is found in verses 13 and 14. But let's begin again. Let's read through these specific verses of the story of Jesus Christ's birth. Look at verse number 4 again. <clears throat> and Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Ju I'm sorry. From Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with, a, a, an, with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill, Toward men, And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go, even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. Now, some of these you may not be familiar with if you did not grow up in church. If you haven't watched maybe uh, Christian movies or seen you know, uh, different Christian uh, material being presented. But if you are familiar with the nativity scene specifically and maybe different uh, children's movies that will present the Christmas story of his birth, I would just like everyone to try to guess for me quickly, what are the angels doing every time after they're done there? And what would be verses 13 and 14? What are the angels actually doing when they're speaking unto the shepherds after the news is announced? What do the angels break into? What do they start doing? They break into song. That is not found in Scripture. I've never heard anyone ever point this out before, but that is not found in Scripture anywhere. They praise God here, but they do not break into song. I want you to look. So there in verse 12, he ends uh, you know, his, his statements about identifying who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. And it says this. Praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Now, does it specifically say that they're singing? It doesn't say that at all, does it? It does not say that they're breaking into song. It doesn't say that they're singing at all. It just says that they are praising God. Most of the time when you look at people praising God in the Bible, they're not singing. If you just look up praising God, if we're going to use the Bible as a definition, people are in the temple praising God, people are doing all different sorts of things, and they're not singing. So that, that is something that's being added to Scripture. You may say that's small. It's important. Everything in the Bible is important. Let's not add into God's Word, God's Word no matter how small or how big it is. So let's just read the text for what it says. <clears throat> so no, that it does not say that they are singing. It just says that they are praising God and saying... Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill for men. So they're just worshiping God, and they're repeating and saying these words, speaking of the good news to come. The next thing that I want, I want to point out a truth to you, a fact, is that there is, is one truth about the nativity scene, maybe, maybe, maybe another one, we'll look at it in a minute, but the shepherds do arrive immediately 
after the birth of the child. Look at chapter 2, verse 16, here where we are. It says in chapter 2, verse 16, <clears throat> And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph. And then it says, And the babe lying in a manger. So notice it tells you, number one, that they came hurrying, or they came quickly. And then it mentions specifically that they find him lying in the manger. Which if you go back just a few verses, it says, After he was brought forth, he's immediately laid in the manger, showing that this happens very quickly afterward. That's why it says they came in haste. So immediately after he was born, they, you know, the angel came, told the shepherds, announced the news of the birth of the Messiah to the shepherds, and then the shepherds hasted, they hurried, and got there almost immediately and saw the baby there at that time lying in a manger. I want you to look at verse number 16 at the very end, what it actually says. Too, so this is going to be important in a minute. We're going to cross-reference a couple of verses. It says at the very end, the last statement, and the babe. So they found the babe lying in a manger. Once you go to Matthew chapter number 2, verse number 1. Who is also there? When you look at the nativity scene, who do they also have? There with the shepherds. So you have, you have the, uh, a lot of times, sometimes you'll even have angels. Wow. You'll have, right, the wise men. The wise men, exactly. <coughs> I want you to go to Matthew chapter number 2. I'm going to show you that the wise men were actually not there right after the baby was born. It was much after that. The wise men were not there at the same time that the shepherds were there specifically. <coughs> Michaela, will you give me some water? Look at uh, Matthew chapter number 2. I want you to look at verse number 1. So this is also the Christmas story just from a different perspective. So we'll read down through here. Matthew chapter number 2 verse number 1 says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that, that excuse me, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. So it says at the time when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And they say this, for we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Look at verse 3. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests, notice they're in Jerusalem at this moment right now. And scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Verse 5, and they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among, <clears throat> among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Verse 7, then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. Now, that's very key for just a moment. Notice, he asked them how long it was since the star had appeared. Look at verse 8. And he sent them to Bethlehem. So now they're having to travel from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. Is this taking place at the same time, the same day? It's not. Look at this. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently, look at this, for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Notice what it said, where the young child was. Now, specifically, the reason why that's important is because when the shepherds go, what does it say that they find? They find a babe, it says, a babe lying in a manger. Now, when they arrived, the three wise men... Well, or the wise men, let me correct that, and I'll fix that in a moment. I'll straighten that out in a second. But when the wise men arrive, what does it say that they find? A young child. Total, two totally different uh, descriptions. The young child was further proof of that. Look at verse 10 and then 11. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with great exceed, with, I'm sorry, with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into what? The house. When they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. Go back to Luke chapter number 2. I should have told you to keep your hand there. Go back to Luke chapter number 2. Now, <coughs> 
We believe the King James Bible is perfect, of course. There are a lot of people that try to attack the King James Bible right here just because they love that nativity scene so much. Now, I don't know if you've heard this before, but when the Bible, the King James Bible says the word in, a lot of the newer versions and a lot of proponents of the newer versions have tried to debate that that word should actually be upper room. It should be in because the King James Bible is perfect. I N N. I want you to look here at what it says in verse number Look at verse number six. <clears throat> and so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Look at this now. Because there was no room for them in the end. Now, notice the reason why she laid him in a, in a manger. What was the purpose or the reason? Because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, why would they be? Why would they be going to an inn? What is an inn? It's a form of a motel. What are they doing? They're traveling in a foreign country. Doesn't it make perfect sense that they would have to just, you know, come and check into an inn? In that sense, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Perfect sense. So the other thing that I wanted to point out here. Is that it says, verse 7, she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. And it says, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. So where are they located when they lay him in the manger? The point is that they're not able to go inside of a home. So all that she has access to is what? A manger. So the logical conclusion, which we don't know this for a fact, but the logical conclusion is that she's in something like a barn. Doesn't that make perfect sense? That's what we'll see them in like a stable, which is what you see very often in the nativity scene. I've heard some people say that they kept their animals oftentimes like in some sort of a cave. I guess that's a possibility, but I would say that that's doubtful. Because I would say that they're close to an inn, and they go to the inn, they can't get there, they're still in town, they're not out by a mountain or something like that, they're still located in town. They find a barn close by where people are living, right? Not way out. So they're looking for somewhere to go, and then they go into the inn. They are next to the inn, there's probably a barn, they go into the barn, and then she brings forth her firstborn son and lays him in a manger. The other point is this, I don't know what, how people picture this, but I've heard so many times, and maybe it's just the poor wording, but people will often say that Jesus was born in a manger. Have you heard that before? Numerous times. I mean, I, you know, people, every time they say it, they say he was born in a manger. The Bible does not say that at all. The Bible says that actually the opposite of that. He was born, it doesn't tell you where and how this actually took place. And then she laid him in a manger. So the manger was not used as like a birthing stool or anything like that. She, the baby is birthed and born, and then the baby's taken and then set or laid in the manger after he's wrapped in swaddling clothes. So notice that there's a distinction between where they are located when the shepherds are there and then when the wise men are there, proving that these are at two, different, two totally different times. They're in a house when the wise men show up. When the shepherds are there, there's no room in the inn. And they have to put the baby in a manger, saying they're in some sort of barn. Some, a manger, like I said this morning, is like a trough. It's where animals will feed out of. Go back to Matthew chapter number 2. Matthew chapter number 2. <coughs> Look there at the end. Again, verse number 11. It says, And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Verse number 12, and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And speaking of the wise men, of course, I want to point out, number one, that they are wise men. Wise men. What does the song call them? We three kings. The Bible never refers to them as kings one time. That's another misconception. It's, they are never called kings. You can look through it. Maybe they're, uh, it is assumed that they are kings because they're carrying gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That's a mis that is a, a misconception majorly because you need to understand why the gold, frankincense, and myrrh is being brought. Why? Because they're bringing it unto the king. Because Jesus is a king, not because they're a king. The Bible never calls them a king one time. They're actually referred to just as wise men. Wise men from the east. We should, to be biblical, change that, that song to say, we three men, we three men of Orient are, right? Amen. Now, here, another thing I want to point out is, 
The Bible never says one time that there are three men, or it never says three kings, but that there are three men that come, or three wise men that come. It never gives you specifics on that. If you look in Matthew chapter number 2, verse number 1, you'll see that it does not give you a specific number. You can read through yourself later just to check it. It says in verse 1, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. It tells you that they are wise, that they are men, and that they are from the east, but it does not tell you how many are there. It just says that there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. I read through here a couple of times earlier trying to see where they could have gotten it specifically, and obviously the, the obvious one is that they have three presents. But I wanted to know, like I wanted to look at the pronouns and stuff, and to be 100% honest, when you read verse 11, it seems as if it's very possible that there are three of them. Now, I don't know for a fact, and I'll point it out to you in just a moment, whether there are three. It could read other way, the other way as well. But if you look at verse number 11, notice <coughs> what it says. And when they were come into the, in the house, <coughs> they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And then it says this. And when they had opened their treasures, now you can say that that's collective. But it would make perfect sense if it was individually each person opened their treasure that's going to be going to the child. And when they had opened their treasures, it says this, and it seems almost as they do this at the same time. They presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now, I don't know how many are there, but it would make perfect sense that there were three. I'm not going to say that there were three because I don't want to add into God's word. But just reading the text, it would make perfect sense that there were three. There's three gifts. It says that they opened there. makes it seem like it's individual. each individual opened the present. Or you could say that there's five of them and they all are just ripping the, the gifts open at the same time like kids in Christmas morning. You don't know how this took place, right? There could be five, but you know what? There could be two. It would make more sense if there were three. But why, you know, what we need to walk away from this sermon tonight is let's not add into God's word. If you find out that there are three, let me know. And I'll preach that there's three. But we don't know for a fact. It's very possible that there are three, but they are not three kings. They are three wise men. They're never referred to as kings. They are three wise men. Now, <clears throat> another thing I want to point out is that the star was never over top of the... It was, it, what, where, where do you always see the star? The nativity scene. The star was never over top specifically of the, of the nativity scene as in like the barn or where he was the manger. I'll prove that to you. So they see the star immediately. It tells you in Matthew chapter number 2 verse number 1. It says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. So they're coming from the east, right? And then it says in verse 2, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. So they saw it, and I, I believe when it says in the east, they saw it from the east. They're in the east and they're seeing it from, in the sense of in. But I want you to look down at verse number, uh, let's look at verse number 8 and 9. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, Bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed. Now watch this. And lo, the star. What's that mean, and lo, the star? <coughs> it appeared again. Behold, they're able to see it again. So for a period of time, they didn't see the star anymore. That's why they actually went and inquired. And I'm going to show that to you here in just a moment. They inquired of Herod of where he is. So it says, and lo, the star. So when they left, lo, the star, which they saw in the east. So notice they're able to see it again, right? They were able to see this star when they were in the east. It says, lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Notice that the star is mobile. The star is moving. The star is not stationary just right over. They're just following the star. I don't know if you've ever noticed that before, but it, it's actually... You know, uh, um, you know, specific to God's nature throughout the Bible. When the children of Israel were traveling throughout uh, the, uh, the wilderness, what did they do? They followed the fiery pillar. They followed you know, the, the fiery pillar at night and just the pillar of smoke during the day. And it moved around and they followed it through. Look, at, look one more time just to be careful. When they had earned the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before.
before them until it came and stood over where the young child was. Now, it could have actually originated in the east, out there where they were. I don't know how far east they are. You know, we say, you know, Orient, like Oriental, like out in, you know, the Asian countries. I don't know if that's where they were, specifically. A lot of people say Babylon. I don't know. They were in the east. They were east of Jerusalem, Bethlehem area. And it could have originated when they were out there, and then they just followed it through the east until they got to that point. Or it could have popped up just ahead of them anywhere, just where they were able to see it. And they knew of the scriptures, and they were told of these prophecies, and they obviously served the God of the Bible, and then they followed it. That's possible. I don't know which way actually how this worked. I have no idea, but I do know that it's mobile. And after this point, it actually appears, it comes up, and then it says, look at this, which the, it says it's the star, lo, the star, verse 9, the very in the middle, which they saw in the east, and then it says, went before them till... It came, talking about the star, till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now, is this the manger that it's standing before? Skip down to verse 11. And when they were coming to the house. So notice that star was not over, it was not over specifically the manger or it was not over the stable. So that's actually another falsehood of the nativity. So you need to take down your nativity scene. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, you really should. But uh, turn to... Uh, Let's go to, uh, we're going to switch gears real quick. This will be the second to last thing we're going to look at. <clears throat> I smell that turkey in there, so it'll be a shorter sermon tonight. Go to Jeremiah chapter number 10. <clears throat> Say amen and I'll add 15 minutes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter number 10. Now, of course, I have to bring this up because this is talked about so much. I heard this when I was a kid. So many different people on all sides. You know, there's a lot of independent fundamental Baptists that are that are wrong about what I'm getting ready to show you right now. And it is the teaching that just Christmas trees are pagan. And I'm going to cross-reference this here in a moment just to further prove this. A cross-reference that I'm sure you've never seen before. To further prove what Jeremiah 10 is teaching. All throughout the internet, you can get access to multiple uh, 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 videos. They're not sermons because it's normally not people preaching it. It's some guy with a video camera, you know, talking about Nimrod, and then he throws in there, you know, the, the pagan Christmas tree. It's always the same types of people. Here's the thing. The Christmas tree being pagan is never found in the Bible one time. The Bible never says anything about something about a Christmas tree. That is never mentioned the only time if you ask people that believe this to take you to a passage, they always turn you to the same place. Jeremiah chapter number 10. Jeremiah chapter number 10. I'm going to show you that Jeremiah chapter 10 is not talking about a Christmas tree. Jeremiah chapter number 10 is not talking about a Christmas tree. We're going to read the, the chapter in its context and, context, and then we are going to parallel or cross-reference it with almost an identical chapter that sheds even more light on this specifically. Look at Jeremiah chapter number 10, verse number 1. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, <coughs> learn not the way of the heathen. Now a pagan is a heathen, right? So this is where they say, see, I'm going to show you that Christmas trees are pagan. I'm going to show you right now because we're talking about the heathen. What does the heathen do? Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of, the hev of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. Right there, that, <coughs> the, don't be dismayed at the signs of the heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. That's stuff like horoscopes. I'm being serious. I would stay away from like horoscopes and things like that. That stuff's not good because you see, you know, people all throughout the Bible worshiping the stars, trying to divine you know, uh, based upon the stars, prophesy thing based upon the stars. What are horoscopes? I'm going to tell you your future based upon when you were born, based upon the stars and astrology and all that. It's not good. Right. And what do you see in doing that? The heathen. Stay away from stuff like that. Whether you're comfortable, you know, doing it or that feels wrong to you or not, that I said that, that's Bible. Stay away from horoscopes. Amen. Look at verse number three. For the customs of the people are vain. For one... Cut up the tree out of the forest. So let's follow this step by step. What do we have right now? We have a tree that's taken. Just like that tree over there. Except it's a real tree. And it's cut down. That's what we have, right? An axe is even mentioned here, I believe, at the end. Yeah. <clears throat> cut up the tree out of the forest. The work of, <coughs> of the hands of the workmen with the axe. Verse 4. <coughs> They deck it with silver 
and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. So they stop right there. You know what word they focus on? They home in on there? Deck. They deck it with silver and with gold. Now, I'll say this. Before I read the Bible a lot, before I knew the Bible's language, because the King James Bible reads a little bit differently than the way in which we speak today. That's a fact. Before I knew the Bible's language and I studied the Bible's language, I could see how the untrained you know, Bible student or an untrained Christian could be presented with this and be like, whoa, I am getting rid of my Christmas tree. I can understand that, really. But I'm going to show you specifically in the context that there's no way that this is talking about a Christmas tree. Number one, the very first definition, and I didn't look it up in there, but I've looked it up before. The very first de definition in any main dictionary, if you look it up, the word deck, do you know what it means? To cover. To cover, to cover right? That is why we call, you know, in, in the back, what we would sometimes consider to, as a porch. That's why you call it a deck. Because there is a framing structure, and then you put down a deck, and then it's just left with the deck. Like, I do a lot of construction, and you know what it's called when you're getting ready to plywood something? We're going to deck this. That's, what, that's the lingo that is used on a construction site. What, what phase are you on right now? Well, we just, you know, we just hung our trusses, or we just hung you know, our joists, and we're getting ready to put down the decking. That's what it's called, because we are going to cover what we had existing. You're not going to see the joists anymore. The joists are, you know, it's, it's just two by eights that are just laying like this. And then you put plywood down over top of it. That's called decking. What phase are you in your project? We're getting ready to deck it with plywood. It means to cover it entirely. That's what, that's the most common, you know, definition of the word deck. But people see deck and silver and gold and there's a tree and it's got to be a Christmas tree. No, deck here means to cover Deck here means to fully and entirely cover. Put it all the way over. Deck. Then also, what do we see? <laughs> it says, they fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. So what we have is a, a tree. Or I almost said Christmas tree. A tree, right? That has been taken and covered with what? Silver and gold. And then it's nailed down. Now... Before I even go any further, I, I just went out there and I cut a tree, I put it right here, and common sense, before I deck it or cover it all with silver and gold, what am I going to do? Just cut all of the, the, the branches off. Right? I'm not going to leave the branches and then just cover it in silver and gold. Right? You're going to do that because I would fashion it. If I'm covering it, I'm going to be fashioning it. That would be very messy and sloppy if the branches are all everywhere. So I would, of course... And I'm going to show this further, that it says this you know, in the latter portion. I would cut all the branches off, and then I would cover it with silver and gold. What do I have? Just picture what I just explained. Without me even using the word, what was it? An idol. An idol. Right? I cut down. What do you think idols are made out of? Wood. But where do you think they got them? You think it's just a big clump of, of metal? No, it's wood. They, they take something, and they have a basic shape. They need a basic shape to work with. They have something that's hard, a basic shape, and then they pour it over that. That's, that's the usual way. That's the easiest way and the usual way of making anything like that. It's nor there's normally some sort of, you know, like a, maybe a, to nowadays like a plastic, something that's easier to be put into a clump that's going to hold some sort of structure, and then they'll pour it over top of it, and then they'll take a fashioning knife, and they'll fashion it and form it, Right? Well, look further. Let's read this. Verse 5. They are upright <coughs> as the palm tree. So this is something that's upright like a palm tree or like a tree, right? But speak not. Now, hold on. Why would it be saying that this doesn't speak? It makes perfect sense if it's an idol. Right. Look what it says next. They must needs be born. Why would that matter? It needs to be carried. Why would that matter? Because it's made into like a person. It's made into like a god. He's saying they can't speak. You know what this is said about all the time in the Bible? Idols. All the time. They can't hear, speak. You know, not, I can't remember. I, I used to have one of the verses quoted where this is said, but it's mentioned multiple times. You know, neither can they, you know, it'll say neither can they speak or hear, and they must needs be born. This, this very similar statement is made repeatedly. I should have looked that up. Repeatedly about idols. 
It's God mocking the idol is what it is. Th these people, their foolishness of the heathen. And what does the heathen always do in the Bible? Every time, what do they do? They're worshiping idols. You never find a heathen getting a Christmas tree and, de and, and, and decorating a Christmas tree. That's ridiculous. Right. That's never found in the Bible one time. Right. Look at what it says later. So it says, they deck it. I'm sorry, verse 5. Uh, they must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them. Why would you be afraid of them? Because it's a false god. That's what they say. Don't be afraid of them because it's not a real god. Be not afraid of them for they cannot do evil. Saying they can't hurt anyone. Neither also is it in them to do good. They're not real. The idol is not real. That's the point. For as much as there is none like unto thee. So what did he just do? Amen. He contrasted the idol, the false god that can't do evil, with who? The real god that right. can do evil. Not sin, but destruction. Right. He can hurt. He can do good. He can do things. He can hear. He doesn't need someone to carry him around. Right. Notice that, because this is going to be very important in our cross-reference. And then he says, verse 6, for as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great and might. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it appertain. For as much as among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms there is none like unto thee. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. Now watch this. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. What's, what is a stock? I'm talking about the wood again. I'm talking about that tree again. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. Silver, look at this, spread into place. What does it mean to spread it? It's talking about them decking it. They're spreading it all over the stock. They're, they're covering the stock. Spread into plates is brought from Tarshish and gold from Euphas, the workmen of the work the work of the workmen and of the hands of, look at this, the founder. You know what a founder is in the Bible? You know what they're always making? Every time the word founder comes up, they're making an idol. They're creating an idol. Look it up for yourself. 90% of the time, <clears throat> it's an idol. Blue and purple is their clothing. They are all the work of cunning men. But the Lord is the true God. Notice that. He's the true God. Why? Because people are worshiping what we just described. But the Lord, that's not a real God. But the Lord is a true God. Man. You think people actually believe that Christmas trees were gods? Come on. They're talking about idols, my friend. Right. Look, the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble. Saying again, he can do evil. He can hurt. He can destroy. It says, and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. Thus shall ye say unto them, watch this, the gods, little g, talking about the idols, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. When he uttereth his voice, there's a multitude of waters in the heavens and he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. Watch this. We haven't changed context. Every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image. Case closed. Right. Super clear. Every founder, that founder we were talking about before, what was he doing? He was making a graven image. God's contrasting the idol with the true God. Okay? Now, it says every founder is confounded by the, by the graven image for his molten image. Talking about decking it with silver and gold. Talking about spreading it into silver plates. For his molten image is falsehood. Look at this again. And there is no breath in them. Notice that. There's no breath in them. What do you need to speak? Breath. Look over there again at verse number 5. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. It's the same thing. Okay? Now, keep your hand here and go to Isaiah chapter number 40, verse number 19. We'll see the exact same context, the exact same statements. Isaiah chapter number 40, verse number <coughs> 19. Let's look at verse 18 first. <clears throat> to whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare unto him? Does that sound familiar? What was God doing? Saying, I'm the true God, and they're not, in Jeremiah chapter 10. So he starts off, verse 18, To whom then will you liken God, or what, or wit, or what likeness will you compare to him? The workman, that sound familiar? Melteth a graven image, and the goldsmith spread 
with, look at this, it over with gold and casteth silver chains. Almost like six or seven of the same words. They talk about gold, they talk about silver, they talk about spreading it, the workman and the founder. Look further, look at verse 10. <clears throat> he that is so impoverished that he hath no oblation chooseth a tree that will not rot. Why does he choose the tree? Why? Because he's got to cut down the tree and then he spreads gold and silver over top of it. This is as plain as the nose on your face. There is no way out of this. Christmas trees are never talked about as being pagan ever in the Bible. Amen. Ever. There is nothing wicked or sinful about a Christmas tree. Right. You, if you think it's sinful, then show me something in the Bible. If it's not in the Bible, then you are teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. That's what you are doing, and that's sinful, my friend. Right. That is a sin when you try to impress what you believe, and it's not what the Bible teaches upon me or upon anyone else. Right. Because you cannot prove that from the Bible. You can have your own opinions, and you can have your own convictions, but don't try to tell me I can't have a Christmas tree. Amen. Because if I want to have a Christmas tree, I'm going to have a Christmas tree if the Bible doesn't say I can. Right. There's nothing wrong with it. Right. If there was something wrong with it, I'd throw my Christmas tree out. Amen. I'd try to live my life as close to this book as I can. And I thought, when somebody pointed this out to me in the beginning, like, oh man, we are going to have to not put up a Christmas tree this year. And then I looked further and it became very clear what it's teaching. Mm -hmm. On the surface, I totally understand a person saying this. But if you are going to have this strong faith about it, you better look closely, more close to Scripture. If you are going to have a strong conviction about something like this, you better make sure that you've studied this subject out. Especially if you're going to go to the point where you're going to start telling other people they should take down their Christmas tree. You better make sure that you know what the Bible teaches on this subject. Look further. <clears throat> Isaiah 40, verse 20 again. So it says, Choose of the tree that will not rot. He seeketh unto a cunning workman to prepare a graven image. Look at it. That shall not be moved. Why is it not moved? What did they do to the other tree? They got hammered, they got nailed, and they fastened it that it moved not. Literally every single element is found right here. Even without Isaiah 40, 19, the whole context of Jeremiah 10 is about an item. The whole context. But comparing this on top of that, there's no way out of it. Christmas trees are not pagan. Even if you look up the history of Christmas trees, and I've looked it up and I've read about it probably three different times, they came from Germany. It was a practice that they were doing in Germany, and Catholics were doing it. But you know what? That doesn't make it sinful. I'm not saying that you have to have a Christmas tree. I'm not saying you're sinning if you don't have a Christmas tree. Just because Catholics put up a Christmas tree at a certain time, and I do it too, doesn't make it wrong. There's a lot of things that Catholics do that I do too. Do you understand what I'm saying? We both do a lot of the same things. We both drink milk and wear clothes. Are those things sinful? Do you understand what I'm saying? How far you can take this? Where do we draw this line? You know where we draw the line? The Bible. Amen. So if it's wrong, then the Bible better tell me it's wrong. Okay? So the Bible tells you what you should do and what you shouldn't do. And we follow God's law. That's where we draw our line. And this everything's pagan attitude is foolishness. Right. I'll tell you what's pagan, the things that heathen, because the word pagan is not in the Bible. If you find a heathen doing it and God's condemning it, don't do it. In the Bible. And if you find something that I'm doing that a heathen's doing in the Bible, you better tell me and I'll stop doing it. But having a Christmas tree is not one of them. Amen. That is not it. We need to look and study the Bible. I want you to go to Romans 14. I'm going to end on this note. Romans chapter number 14. You guys thought I was kidding about hurrying the sermon up. Romans chapter number 14. Now, the last point I want to make is this. It's very possible that Jesus was not born on December 25th. Right. Very possible. And I'll tell you two reasons why. <clears throat> number one is that the shepherds were out in the field with their flocks, right? I looked up temperatures. I've done it one other time that I couldn't remember. I looked up temperatures in Israel, in that in that part of you know Jerusalem and all of that, and it can get around zero degrees at night, you know during uh, December and January months. I find it hard to believe that shepherds are outside all during that time. 
I find it hard to believe. Number one, but on top of that, and this is the biggest proof, I know, I, I, I can't say I know for a fact, but I feel very, very confident that the Roman government would not have called for a census and people to be traveling during that period of time. I think that's the biggest proof. That just, it, it, and we don't know. I mean, there's one out of 365 chances that he was born on Christmas Day. But if I had to just use my logic and look at the Bible, it's very unlikely. And specifically, if you want a census, you desire so that you can get people's taxes. You're the Roman government. Are you going to make that census at the most hardest time of the year to travel? And you're like, how do you know it's hard to travel? What did Jesus say in Matthew 24? Pray ye that your flight be not in winter. So think about this. You, I just thought of this earlier. So think about this. So if they're wanting to get your money, right, and they do, they want to find out as many people as there are so you can pay them, and you have to travel all the way back to your hometown, which is why Joseph and Mary went back to Bethlehem, because that's where he was. said he was of the house and lineage of David. Would, would you, as the emperor, do it in a hard-to-travel month or a, a, a lighter time to travel? Lighter time. The hardest time to travel is in winter, according to Jesus. So what makes the most sense? He probably was born in the summer. Just a fact. But you know what? I never thought that he was born on December 25th. And you shouldn't have either. The Bible never says he was born on December 25th. You know what we should teach our kids? We should teach our kids that this is a time that we just set aside to acknowledge Jesus Christ's birth. And he was born and that he came. I'm not saying that he was born on December 25th. But you know what? I like to set that time aside so that I can reflect upon what he did for me. And that he came and that he was born on this earth. Amen. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Especially, you, and I do believe you shouldn't you should be telling your kids, Jesus was born on this day. You have no idea. The Bible doesn't teach that. You have no idea. That's not right. right. But this day just represents that. And that's what days, if you look at holidays all throughout the Bible, it just represents these days many times. It'll just represent this or represent that. They'll do the, you know, uh, the, uh, <coughs> what is it called? The, uh, uh, the Lord's Supper, you know, one of the, the main ordinances, I can't even remember what it's called, the Lord's Supper. They do the Lord's Supper what? To just to, this do in remembrance of me. What's the reason of it? Just do it in remembrance of me. Well, you know what? I want to do Christmas in remembrance of Jesus' birth. Amen. There's nothing wrong with that. Look at Romans 14, verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, <coughs> but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgeth, uh, judgeth another man's servant to his own master? He standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. Look at uh, verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another. Does he say what kind of day or the reason why? No, just one man esteems one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. <laughs> he doesn't have any kind of holy days or holidays, does he? It's just like every day is the same. I don't have a certain day that I set apart. But look what it says at the end of verse 5. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Does it sound like one guy's wrong and one guy's not? You don't want to celebrate Christmas? No big deal. No skin off my back. I don't care. That's fine. I'm not going to try to force you to celebrate Christmas. But you know what? I want to celebrate Christmas. And I like setting that time apart. You know, we shouldn't get caught up in all the commercialization and make it. And you, and, and you shouldn't be teaching your children about Santa. Right. You know, or Satan, no, I'm just kidding. You shouldn't be teaching your kids about Santa, right? You should not be lying to them and teaching them that there's someone that watches them, and if they're naughty or they're nice, then they get a present. That is actually, it, and, and if you look it up, you know, Santa was a real person, and it was Saint Nicholas, right? And Saint Nicholas was someone who went to, and this is another reason why Valley Baptist shouldn't. Does anybody know who he is, actually? Well, I'll drop the bomb on you. He was one of the people that went to the, uh, the uh, Nicene Council. He was one of the people that like, took part in actually uh, writing the, uh, the um, whatever it's called, the Nicene Creed. I was thinking, trying to think of the word creed. The Nicene Creed. 
And he's real well known because he, uh, he uh, one of the Aryan guys, him and an Aryan got into a fight. If you look it up, this is what he's known for. And he like punched this Aryan in the face like while they were arguing. In, in there when you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Constant, Constantine was there. And he almost got, like lost his position as like a priest and stuff because they're Catholics. He was a priest, basically. Saint Nick. So it makes sense that you'd have Santa, Saint Nick, they like, you know, praise the dead. And what is he going to do? He's going to give you a present or a gift if you're naughty or nice. Now, what do the Catholics teach about salvation? Works. you got to be good if you want a gift. The gift's free, right. like we talked about this morning. Amen. The gift is free, but it would make perfect sense that if anybody misunderstood a gift, it would be a Catholic. Right. They read their Bibles, supposedly. They stand up and read their Bibles to their congregation from time to time, and nobody knows what a gift means. You know, it would make perfect sense that this is more has more of like a Catholic origin. And there's problems with that. You're lying to your children, number one. No lies are okay. Right. Nothing's all right. Never. You're never, you know, it's never all right to lie, ever. So you shouldn't lie to your kids about it. And also, if you look into it, it doesn't have a good origin in that sense. It, it, and, and it pollutes their mind in the, in the, in the sense of, of, of teaching them a false idea of what a gift is. I don't want to mess my kids up and I have to straighten them out before I preach them the gospel, especially at a young age. I mean, that's terrifying, right? You know, so you, you don't want to be teaching them something that's, that's contrary to the Bible. You, know, you, don't get, you, know, you don't get a gift if you're good or you're bad. It's not a gift then. It's just a free gift, right? They're not paying anything for it or anything along those lines, right? So, you know, look at verse 6. We'll end here. We're going to read verse 6 as well, and this is the last verse we'll read. He that regardeth the day. So this is a guy that regards it or esteems it was the word he used in the prior verse. You, you think this day is better than the other days. Like this day, like Christmas, like a holiday or a holy day. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. That is a perfect picture of what Christmas is in the first place. Because right. I regard that day, and you know the whole reason why I regard that day. Unto the Lord. Amen. You know, for many years, I, you know what I do on, uh, on Christmas Day? I did it when we would go over to my dad's house for like, for like six or seven years. I just open up Luke 2 before we read any presents. I do this at my house personally too, but when my whole family gets together when I was in Cincinnati area, before we open any presents, I would say, hey, let me read Luke chapter number 2 before we open any presents. Why? Because I want to make sure even when we're doing other things, let's understand what this is about. You know the reason why you, you know, if you celebrate Christmas, the reason why, what it should be about? Not the gifts, not the materialism, you know, not reindeers and all of that. Regard it unto the Lord. Amen. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. For he, for he giveth God thanks. And he that giveth not, giveth, eateth not, I'm sorry, to the Lord, eateth not and giveth God thanks. So notice the guy that's eating, he's giving God thanks. The guy that decides he doesn't want to eat, he gives God thanks. So that, that, of course, is you're not sinning by not celebrating Christmas just because it is under the Lord. But you know what you still should do? You should regard that day under the Lord. You should regard that day under the Lord. Even still, find some other way to regard that day under the Lord, right? But if you want to set a day apart specifically, there's nothing wrong with that because that's what the Bible is. You can set apart a day, you know, Easter, you know, Christmas, these days for the Lord. Just set the days apart for the Lord. There's nothing wrong with that. And if you decide not to, it doesn't bother me a bit. Just don't try to come in here and talk crap about the Christmas tree or I'll throw you out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for this day. We thank you, dear God, for coming to this earth and being born. We're so thankful for the free gift, dear Lord. We're so thankful for everything that you did for us for our salvation. Help us to regard this day unto you, dear God. Help us to, to give thanks unto you, dear Lord, all year round, dear Lord. And uh, be with us and bless us, dear Heavenly Father, during this time. Bless the food, those that made it. And also bless us that eat it. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. <coughs>